Hello from a sunny but rather cool Manchester. And I'm sorry I can't be with you live on the day of the meeting. That's due to other commitments. I've been asked to talk about the diabetic neuropathic foot and lessons from leprosy and Dr. Paul Brand. Now, some of you may not know who Dr. Paul Brand was. So I'll let you know, because if you're working in a diabetic foot, then you owe much of what you do in treating neuropathic foot ulcers to his observations in leprosy, uh, mainly in India and later in the United States. He was the one who talked about the gift of pain. Pain is the gift nobody wants. And it's only when you've lost that gift that you realize how useful pain is to protect you from injury. He was a surgeon and a missionary, and he worked in leprosy and later in diabetes. And I think he took the foot from art to science. He introduced scientific studies. So he was born in 1914 near Madras, now Chennai in India, of British parents who were missionaries. He was sent back to boarding school in the UK, higher education, and he started work as a builder and a carpenter, which probably helped him later in his delicate surgery in the hand and foot. He went to medical school, University College in London, and he met his future wife, Margaret Berry, who was on training to be an ophthalmologist. And she also worked in leprosy and was a missionary as well. So it was during the Second World War when he was a junior doctor in London. He was a surgical assistant for Great Ormond Street and other hospitals. When he learned how to reconstruct the hands and feet of people who had been injured badly during the bombing of London uh, in the 1940s. And his reputation, and indeed one surgical procedure was later named after him, his reputation led him to be invited by the renowned leprologist, Dr. Robert Cochrane, to this Christian medical center in Belor, Tamil Nadu state uh, in India. And he arrived and saw sites like this, young people missing limbs with sores or ulcers to the remaining limbs, such as even the hands. And this was the kind of scenery he saw. This is a photograph I took when on the road from Madras to Velour uh, back in 2000 or so. But the, this was similar sight. So he saw people barefooted putting their feet on the back of this uh, oxen cart and walking barefoot and so on. And he was horrified when he met Cochrane, who said, when he saw people sitting outside the hospital, just like in bibl biblical descriptions, with bleeding hands and feet, there's nothing we can do from these people. This is leprosy. It's a curse from God. These people go to bed at night, and the next morning they wake up with new ulcers. Well, Rand felt that this was not true. He felt that it was nerve damage caused by leprosy, nerve damage that led to the loss of the gift of pain and the lesions one saw in the hands and feet. So to prove this, he built his own hospital and put some young men to bed with leprosy at night to prove that they would not wake up in the morning with bleeding ulcers. To his horror, they did. Some of them had bleeding ulcers on their hands and their feet. Well, he then said, I still don't believe this is true. So he put them to bed, but half of them stayed awake to watch the other half. And the clue came during the night when a rat came from a hole in the wall and started to eat fingers and toes. So he bought a male and a female cat. There were no more new ulcers. That's how it was shown that leprosy causes these awful lesions described in the Bible because of sensory loss, loss of the gift of pain. As I said to you, he later uh, pioneered tendon transfers, later known as the brand uh, operation or procedure. So we still see, and this is my good friend, Dr. Abbas from uh, Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, uh, we still see in developing countries, rat bites as a cause of ulcers. So this was the cause of the ulcers in the young men sleeping at night with loss of sensation. They could not detect this pain. He continued uh, his observations and work and published new surgical techniques for insensitive limbs. He became a Hunterian professor of the Royal College of Surgeons of London. He got the award uh, of the CBE in England. And he was then invited to the United States public health system to head the Leprosy Center 
in Carville, Louisiana, where I have lectured and taught on many occasions. Sadly, now there's less leprosy in the southern states of the United States. And this facility is now uh, an open prison, a rather luxurious one. He then retired to Seattle and was later international president of the leprosy procedure and died in 2003. This old picture uh, from the late 1980s uh, shows many people who are well known for what they described in the Davidic foot, Wagner, not the composer, but he described the Wagner procedure uh, for the classification, the classification of foot wounds, uh, the late Roger Pecorero, whose work on pathways to amputation, Lee Sanders, podiatrist, first ever president, podiatrist president of American Diabetes Association. This is Marv Levin, Levin and O'Neill, the first big textbook on the diabetic foot. Larry Harkless, many of you know, an outstanding uh, podiatrist, now dean of a podiatry school, uh, Gail Ryber, and here's the late Dr. Paul Brown. Now, looking at this person on the left, that is actually me, which shows the dangers of 30 plus years working in this area. This, just to show you, was the hospital he built uh, near Velour in a place called Karigiri in Tamil Nadu. Beautiful grounds and patients were looked after, their feet were treated appropriately. And this is the rather sort of colonial style, the, the Carville Leprosy Center on the banks of the river Mississippi over there to the top right, uh, where Brown later worked before he retired. A very luxurious place for a prison, I, I would think. And here is Dr. Brand. Uh, when I was working at the University of Miami and, uh, 21 years ago, this photograph was taken. I went over to give a lecture in Seattle. And here's the uh, David Armstrong, uh, my former PhD student, who you all know now. Uh, and people say I've never been the same since he was my student, but I'll leave you to judge that. So what were Brand's contributions to help us understand management of the insensitive foot? First of all, clinical observation. He was a good clinician. He not only looked, but he saw. He not only listened, but he heard. And he made this remark. Any patient with a plantar ulcer who walks into your clinic without limping to protect the injured area must have neuropathy. As I said, he described pain as, uh, pain as God's greatest gift to mankind. And the art that he discovered, described was, you know, what's the best thing we can do to reduce amputation? Every time you see someone with diabetes, remove the shoes and socks and look at the feet. But as I'll show, the science, he developed ways to assess the relationship between pressure, time, and ulceration. Uh, this was in Carville, Louisiana, in the canine highland. Now, he told me neuropathy, I'm sure, he said, I'm sure that neuropathy is the cause of ulcers, but nobody's shown it in the longitudinal study. So he was happy when we actually showed that this was true, in a five-year follow-up study, started back in 1988, soon after I came to Manchester, we assessed uh, just under 500 patients with vibration perception by the biasthesiometer and recorded foot ulcers. You're familiar with this uh, machine here. The higher the reading, the more significant the sensory loss. And we were able to show uh, that those with no normal sensation, a VPT less than 15, the risk per patient per year of getting a new ulcer was less than 1%. If you had a, a vibration perception threshold of greater than 25, moderate or severe sensory loss, your rate was nearly one in 27 fold higher than in those without neuropathy. Uh, we also went on with Gail Ryber and the rest of the Kite to show this important study, causal pathways for foot ulceration, that in the causal pathway, neuropathy alone does not cause an ulcer, but together with other components, it does. Neuropathy, deformity, clortose, prominent metatarsal heads, and trauma were present in nearly two out of three. So 80% of ulcers should be preventable. And the pathway to ulceration, this is a permissive factor, together with other factors, leads to an ulcer. I think we all know that. The second thing that Brand told us about was pressure relief. Remarkably, you know, 60 years ago, he did early foot pressure measurements talked about the contribution of footwear to ulcers and early development of pressure sensing devices to warn of high pressures. Here's a picture from one of his papers, 1963. Pressure is the critical quantity that determines the harm done by the force. 
these were rather primitive transducers, he showed high pressure under previously ulcerated areas. We went on to confirm that this was right in a series of studies and prospectively showed that high foot pressures predict ulcers. Then we were able to show that semi-quantitative measure using something like the Harris map, uh, the pressure stat is used widely, a dynamic pressure print map is inexpensive, easy to use. And in this study by my then research fellow, Corinne van Schrie, appropriately from the Netherlands, because <clears throat> Podo Trap came from the Netherlands, and we showed that this was compared with the gold standard then, the Peter Barograph, this was a good way of detecting high risk areas. The Scottish poet wrote these words, coming events cast their shadows before. Here is the shadow of risk, the darker the area on this pressure tap recording one footstep. And you can have a code here so you can measure how high it is. The higher, the, the darker the area, the higher the foot pressure, darkness equals danger. You can give this to the patient to help them understand which areas under their feet are at risk. Brand also used the total contact cast. In the days even before antibiotics, this had been used in India. It reduces peak pressures. It doesn't remove them, it redistributes them. And in this study, uh, David Armstrong did as part of his PhD with me. Uh, he showed that the total contact cast at every, every time in this 12 week study led to more healing than the removable contact con uh, cast or a, a, a half shoe. Why is this? Well, because people don't wear the cast. DH walkers, for example, offload as well as the cast in laboratory studies. But we showed in a study that this is only worn for 28% of all steps, even when patients know we were watching them. So when working full time in Miami 20 years ago, we did this study, uh, published in 2005, randomizing people to a total contact cast or a removable cast walker rendered irremovable. Here's the standard uh, total contact cast for Patrick's Day. It's Irish, it's uh, Irish population in America. They like things green on St. Patrick's Day. Here's the DH Walker. What we did was simply render it irremovable by a bit of scotch cast wrapped around it. Even I can do that. And it's no great surprise. We showed that if people wear the instant total contact cast, as we call it, there's no difference in outcome. So removable cast walkers works very well as long as they are worn. So equally efficacious, less expensive, do not require skilled technicians and no more risk of complications. Lastly, Brand talked about the importance of heat. The foot heats up before it breaks down. And this is a paper from him uh, just under 40 years ago. Infrared thermography contributes to the care of the insensate limb. It detects areas through heat, irritated areas that are warming up before they break down. This is one of his pictures of a thermogram of this. This is obviously a very warm area. It's probably about to break down, and here it is. This is a foot that's probably been lying on a ward. But nobody's turned the patient, didn't know they had neuropathy. So Larry Lavery asked the question, can we prevent ulceration by identifying just before, at this age, stage here? And of course, he did show that could be done some years ago now, and other studies are ongoing. Skin controlled, in other words, skin temperature self-monitoring plus education. Uh, the standard of ther therapy group, this is a randomized trial sponsored by NIH. It was a very good trial. Therapeutic shoes and insoles, foot education, and podiatry every 10 weeks or less. That's good standard of care. And then there were two intervention groups. One was given a mirror and a logbook so they can inspect their feet and make a note and call their podiatrist if there's a problem. But the other group had this rather old fashioned in Fahrenheit here, I apologize, uh, skin temperature monitoring device. And if they found the temperature was warmer by one to one and a half degrees Celsius more than the other foot, they were advised to rest and see their podiatrist. This group had only 8% recurrent ulcers, all these patients that had previous plantar ulcers, compared with a third of patients ulcerating in the other two groups. So temperature screening can help reduce ulceration in those with a history of previous ulcers. So here were Brand's contributions to the feet that we all use every day in our practice. And I would leave you with the thought of this. 
uh, by Lindsay. He read, wrote these words for one mistake made for not knowing, 10 mistakes are made for not looking. And let me finish with an interesting comment by Brand at his retirement ceremony in India. He wrote this, because of where I practice medicine, I never made much money. But as I look back over a lifetime of surgery, the host of friends who were once my patients bring me more joy than wealth could ever bring. So a, a truly humble, but very intelligent uh, man who contributed so much to the care of the insensitive foot. I thank you for your attention, Motomesk.